Welcome to the video recording of the Virtual Historic Cemetery Walk to Men's Memorial Cemetery. It was prepared and presented by Karina Douglas Takiasu, reference librarian at the Timmins Public Library, originally presented live on Tuesday, August 17, 2021. Before we begin, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. I would like to begin by acknowledging that Timmins is in the Treaty No. 9 territory, which is the traditional land of the Metogamy First Nation. The land on which we gather here today has been home to the Ojibwe and Chippewa, Meshkegawak Cree, Algonquin, and Métis peoples. Before getting into the main part of the presentation, I would like to present some quotations that were taken from various sources regarding large sort of historic points in Timmins history that are going to be covered here today. This first uh, quote comes from a letter that was sent on February 14th, 1928, in the wake of the Hollander Mine Fire, and it comes from W.D. Ross, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. It was published in the Porcupine Advance on February 16th, 1928. And it says, Mayor of Timmins, Ontario, His Excellency, the Governor General of Canada, has asked me to convey his deepest sympathy to the relatives of all those who've lost their lives in the Hollinger Mine disaster. The accompanying painting that you're seeing is called The Backbone of Timmins. It is acrylic and gold flex and was done by Karina Douglas Takyasu in 2020. Uh, if you're a resident of Timmins, you might recognize this as the contemporary view of the Hollinger open pit mine with a little bit of the McIntyre mine head frame in the uh, corner by the miner's shoulder. The symbolic miner and canary in the cage were inspired by an observation that was made when the open pit mine was open to the public for some viewing in October of 2019. As various people were looking down at the active mine, which was also where, the, where many of the miners had lost their lives over the century of service, a person observed that this here is the backbone of Timmins, and this was the inspiration for the picture that you see here with the sort of the symbolic road going down where the miner's actual backbone would be. The next excerpt is um, actually from a poem titled 16 Men. It was said to be written by somebody named A.J. Timmins, which was most likely a pseudonym, and it was published in the Porcupine Advance on February 8, 1945. And this was in response to the Paymaster cage accident in which 16 men were killed when the cable snapped from their double-decker cage and the um, braking mechanisms failed in which they plummeted to their death some 1,500 feet. And the uh, excerpt of the poem says, Down they were going, those men, not to war or battle or to fame, but to do a day's work and then return to the dry, to clean clothes and to home. That was the most they ever asked of in life, a day's work, a day's page, and then home. And the uh, full length poem is actually available on the link here that is supplementing the video. And this photograph comes from the Daily Press that shows the cable of the mine. And basically the 16 men's lives were all suspended from that cable. This excerpt is, comes from the lyrics of the Tragically Hips 50 Mission Cap. Bill Barilko disappeared that summer. He was on a fishing trip. The last goal he ever scored won the Leafs the Cup. They didn't win another until 1962, the year he discovered he was, he was discovered. I stole this from a hockey card I kept tucked under my 50 mission cap. And the 50 mission cap that's referred to in the song is sort of an Air Force um, World War II bombing mission cap. And so it was a hockey cap or a hockey card that was kept under the cap in the song. And the image that you see on the left is a Bill Barocco billboard, which is located beside Highway 101 East on the westbound lane in Porcupine going back towards Timmins. And it is across from the highway at Bannerman Park at Bristol Road. However, the billboard is on private property and very hard to access. And this was photographed uh, from across the highway on August 8th, 2021. Leclerc. The death occurred in St. Mary's Hospital on Wednesday, August 18, 1965, of Mrs. Maggie LeClaire. Loving wife of the late Billy LeClaire, Mrs. LeClaire was born in Nighthawk over a hundred years ago and had resided at Camas Scotia most of her life. And this is an excerpt from the obituary of Maggie LeClaire, taken from the Daily Press, August 19, 1965. And this image that you're seeing here is a portrait, a painted portrait of Maggie Buffalo LeClaire by Mrs. Wilder Clark, which was done in 1954 and is in the collection of the Timmins Museum National Exhibition Center. It's not on permanent display, it is displayed from time to time. And uh, for those that are not familiar, Maggie LeClaire was an indigenous woman that lived in the area, originally from around Nighthawk Lake, and then she uh, 
went and resided at um, near um, Kamaskosha Lake and Mount Kamaskosha, and she was quite well known around the community. And this portrait was done by a local artist. And we'll touch a little bit more on her biography further on in the presentation. I made several cross references in addition to the uh, newspaper articles. Uh, most of the sources used for this presentation include Ancestry Library Edition, findagrave.com, the Porcupine Advance, which is digitized online, the Daily Press, which is only available on microfilm here in the Timmins Public Library, a book titled Mirrors of Stone, Fragments from the Porcupine Camp by Charlie Angus, with uh, photography by Louis Palou, and along with a couple other library books and um, sort of different documents and little local history excerpts that I've done over the years. Also contacted the cemetery department to answer with some of the queries, especially around um, uh, some of the older sections of the cemetery. This is a map of the Timmins Memorial Cemetery as it appears today. If you were to go online to the cemetery website, you could get a copy of it. And it's showing the various sections. A north orientation is going to the right of your screen and it is at the bottom of Pine Street South, uh, just across the street from a trailer park home. This additional map shows um, sort of highlighting and uh, looking at the areas of con that we are concentrating on today, which are the historic Catholic and the historic Protestant sites. Uh, the historic Catholic in yellow, you'll see, is going sort of uh, from south to north as uh, the time went on. The older graves would be more towards the corner where it says Pine Street South, and you see a notation in purple where it says St. Mary's Romanian Cemetery. And the um, historic Protestant site would be newer, having uh, dated um, from 1920 onward, and its growth again is sort of following in the same direction, also going a little bit to the west. A couple things that were not highlighted on the original map is the hill with the crucifix and bench, which is where the photograph on the first slide was taken, as well as St. Mary's Romanian Cemetery, which does not appear. Originally, this was under St. Romani um, Mary's Romanian Church, as an Orthodox church. This is the cemetery here that if you're coming up from Pine Street South, looking towards the Timmins Memorial Cemetery on the left and the little cemetery with the fence on the right. And the Orthodox cemetery was under the um, ownership of the church. The city of Timmins now does look after and maintain the care of the cemetery. However, the records uh, had not been brought over from the um, sort of the head clergyman who unfortunately passed away. So the city of Timmins is still waiting to have the records to find out um, who all is buried in the cemetery. And the Romanian Orthodox Church is located at 94th 8th Avenue, which is at the intersection of Maple Street North and 8th Avenue in Timmins. And this photograph was taken from Google Maps to give you an idea of its location. This is a view from the interior of St. Mary's Romanian Orthodox Cemetery. And uh, there are approximately 35 graves in the cemetery with the earliest um, looking burial date to be 1942. And you can also see that the graves have individual sort of little fenced off areas. There may be more um, graves in the cemetery. Some of the plots look to be much larger than one to two people. Uh, however, without the records, we're not 100% sure. Telling the story of the Timmins Memorial Cemetery you can, uh, requires knowing a little bit about Father Charles Eugene Terrio, uh, who was born in 1886 and passed away in 1956 and is one of the early priests here in the uh, Timmins area. So Father Terrio was born in St. Alois, Quebec on April 24, 1886. He studied at the seminary in Rimouski and then went to Montreal where he met Monsignor Hélène Anisant La Tulipe, who was the Bishop of Haleberry. Monsignor La Tulipe convinced Charles Terrio to join him in Northern Ontario. Father Terrio was ordained as a priest at the Cathedral in Haleberry on September 29, 1910. Monsignor La Tulipe appointed Father Terrio as the parish priest of Porcupine Timmins. And, he, and Father Terrio arrived here on October of 1911, just after the Porcupine Fire. He set up a chapel that became St. Anthony's Church and served as priest in both Timmins and Porcupine. He was also very good friends with Noah Anthony Timmins. And just to give you a little bit of familiarity, some people that may have already seen the Dead Man's Point presentation, 
Um, this is a map of the Porcupine Camp. It's uh, taken from a much larger map from the Ontario Department of Mines report of 1911. And the area that we're sort of looking at today has been highlighted with a yellow box showing at this at the time in 1911, um, Noah Timmons Stakes and the Hollinger Mines, as well as Miller Lake, which today is a Hollinger Park. And then you can also see that there's Gillies Lake sort of off in the corner. And the cemetery is roughly going towards where the bottom of the yellow box is located. And comparing today, this is uh, using Google Maps, approximately the same locations of what was then the Porcupine Camp. You have St. Anthony's Cathedral, uh, which is at the Pine Street North and Fifth Avenue, or sorry, Spruce Street North and Fifth Avenue. Gillies Lake, which is much smaller, is still there. The sort of frog-shaped open pit profile that is Hollinger Mine, Hollinger Park, formerly Miller's Lake, and the Timmins Public Library, which is located in, um, closer to the Hollinger Mine site, as opposed to when it was on, city, on the uh, location of City Hall on Algonquin Boulevard. And down below where you see the circle is the Timmins Memorial Cemetery. St. Anthony's Roman Catholic Church grew from a basement room into needing its own building. There were 72 parishioners that had been buried originally at the church site up on around 5th Avenue, and they were transferred to the Pine Street South location around 1917. Funding for the church construction that had come from the Hollinger Mine, and of course the Hollinger Mine was owned by Noah Timmons. The church was completed in 1922. Father Theriault had also established a Col Saint Antoine in 1918 under the Sisters of the Schlumpchen, and with it he created a bilingual Catholic school board. He would later sponsor the first Catholic secondary school, Academy Don Bosco, followed by Collage Notre Dame for girls, Collage Sacre Cour for boys, and the latter of these two schools would be merged into his namesake high school, uh, Ter Terrio High School, in 1968. Father Terrio also convinced the Hollinger Mine to build St. Mary's General Hospital, which was entrusted to the Sisters of the Providence, and at one point he had also owned the Nighthawk Hotel. The picture that you're seeing on the left is St. Anthony's Roman Catholic Church, the original structure from the, the, the was around from 1922 until 1936, and it was featured in the Christmas issue of the Porcupine Advance, which was sort of highlighting the different buildings, the schools, and the churches around town. When the cemetery was open on Pine Street North, originally it was for the parishioners of the Roman Catholic Church. However, by the late 1910s, the church cemetery was running out of space and Father Terrio purchased land owned by Jack Downton on Pine Street South, which expanded the cemetery. In 1915, there was a cemetery open between Timmins and South Porcupine, which became known as the Tisdale Cemetery. Protestants and other non-Roman Catholic individuals were either buried in Tisdale or Whitney by Dead Man's Point, which were both kind of difficult to access from Timmins. In January of 1919, which would have been in the middle of the influenza pandemic, Mayor, who was also a doctor, J.A. McInnes, spoke of the need for a Protestant cemetery closer to the town than Tisdale. This map shows um, contemporarily how far it would be from St. Anthony's uh, Church to the cemetery, and you can see that it's approximately 2.4 kilometers, or just a little, little more, about around a mile and a half, which wouldn't be too bad to access even 100 years ago. For comparison, the Tisdale Cemetery is approximately 6.3 kilometers or roughly four miles the distance from St. Matthew's Anglican Cathedral. And although it wouldn't be too difficult to access today by road, uh, in 1915, it would have only had uh, access by rail and it would have been very cumbersome in the winter time. By July of 1919, the town of Timmins Clerk was authorized to discuss the cemetery request with Father Terrio. On June 20th, 1920, the Protestant Cemetery was dedicated formerly by Reverend R. Cushing, who came from the St. Matthew's Anglican Church, and Reverend J.D. Parks of the Presbyterian Church. Around 200 people attended the dedication, and the burial of the bodies that had been stored in a nearby vault for the past several months were finally laid to rest. The seminaries were amalgamated by the town of Timmins in 1966. And at some point, the two sort of areas had been staked off and there was a fence that separated them. The fence between the Protestant and the Catholic section of the cemetery was removed sometime in the early 1990s.
There is also a children's section of the cemetery. Uh, section H, located just above the historic Catholic Section F, is the final resting place of many babies and children. In the year 2000, there were 1,400 unknown graves, mainly those of infants, which had been identified. And there's also a memorial mall now with several names on it, which include the names of several individuals that had lived with developmental disabilities. However, it's unknown if the section of the, of the cemetery was originally for children that had not been baptized in the Roman Catholic faith before death, a state that was known as Limbo. Limbo was abolished formally by the Vatican in 2007. And I did inquire with the cemetery department, but have not heard back yet to find out if this was actually the case or if it was just where many children and infants who had been ill had passed away and over time their graves were lost. There is also a Chinese community section in the cemetery, and this touches on a little bit about the Chinese community and the Chinese immigration into Canada and Timmins. The first Chinese people that settled in Canada actually arrived in, in 1788 and helped build a trading post in Nootka Sound, British Columbia. In 1858, the first large group of immigrants arrived in British Columbia and settled, and between 1880 and 1885, some 15,000 Chinese immigrants built the British Columbia section of the Canadian Pacific Railway. In 1885, the first head tax was introduced at $50 per immigrant, and it went up to $500 by 1903. This led to immigration largely being males that worked in labor, mining, and areas of the service industry. However, in the 1911 census, there were 30 Chinese men listed for the Porcupine Camp. On July 1, 1923, the Chinese Immigration Act was replaced by the Chinese Exclusion Act, which ended the head tax but also any immigration into Canada by uh, Chinese individuals, including British citizens that had ethnic Chinese ancestry. In 1947, the Discriminatory Act was repealed and more Chinese families could settle in Canada and Timmins. Around the 1960s, the Chinese community purchased several plots in Section E under historic Protestant, uh, which became the Chinese section of the cemetery. Part of Section T has also been purchased for future graves. And the monument that says, in memory of our fellow countrymen in English in Section E, was dedicated around 1980, the date that is in, written in the Chinese portion of the inscription. There is also a section, not officially, but where you would find more of the Eastern European pioneers and settlers to Timmins and a legion section for veterans. Section I, which borders on the historic Catholic Section E, has the graves of many Eastern European immigrants and pioneers into the Porcupine Camp. And there is also the section that belongs to the Royal Canadian Legion, where veterans and former Canadian Forces personnel are buried. On Friday, February 10, 1928, at around 9 in the morning, Fire was noticed coming from an unused stope at the 550-foot level of the Hollinger Mine. Trash was being stored there and it had caught on fire. The order was given to evacuate men from the underground immediately as the smoking gas is built up. Some were incredulous at the idea of a fire underground, but the seriousness of the situation was realized quickly. Most made it to the surface, but approximately 51 were trapped, of which 12 were able to be rescued. Mine rescue crews were sent from Toronto and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to come in and assist. In a total, 39 men died, and it took up to 5.30 p.m. on Friday, February 13th to recover the last bodies. In the Hollinger Mine fire, all 39 men that had died actually died from asphyxiation or carbon monoxide poisoning, and they ranged in age from approximately 23 to 60 years in age. Four men were from Nova Scotia, two of them W.M. Stevens and Ira B. Graham had their bodies shipped home. Two men from Cornwall, England, Howard Arthur Barrett and Charles Ewart Richards, were friends and buried beside each other, sharing a headstone in Section C, Historic Protestant section of the cemetery. There were nine men, mostly Finnish, who were buried in a mass grave in Section E, the Historic Protestant section. The names and the dates of birth appear on a common grave marker. And the remaining 26 men are buried in individual graves around the historic, proud, and, and Catholic sections. And one of the reasons that I would sort of focused on the um, sort of the memorial to the nine that were passed away is that it is rather sort of into nondescript. I had walked around the uh, monument several times without even realizing 
what it was and that it was actually marking a mass grave until somebody pointed out the locations and I had seen some pictures online of the burial as it happened in 1928. This picture was taken in the winter time uh, when it was quite cold and the snow was sort of fine and powdery and I placed a little bit of snow on the headstone so that you could see the writing and then it would just blow off without melting and running the risk of damaging the headstone. And the names are Walter Altonen, born 1871. Mono Valo, born August 1st, 1903. August Aho, born December 5th, 1901. Alfred Kumpala, born June 21st, 1891. John Kangas, born February 2nd, 1887. Charles Mackey, born August 8th, 1880, sorry, August 11th, 1885. Pekka Heed, born October 1st, 1890. Oscar Avenkosk, born in 1886, listed as natives of Finland. And there was also Michael Swiati. He was born October 14, 1893, in eastern Galicia. They were victims of the Hollander disaster, February 10, 1928. As tragic as the Hollander mine fire was, there were some good things that came from the ashes. In 1929, the Ontario Mine Rescue was founded. After Royal Commission investigation of the Hollander Mine Fire, the creation of the Ontario Mine Rescue Organization was formed under the Ontario Department of Mines. The Timmins Mine Rescue Station was established in 1930, and since the 1940s, mine rescue teams from around the province have tested their skills in an annual competition. There are also national and international competitions. And in 2018, the first all-female pan-provincial team called Diamonds in the Rough was formed, and they placed 15 out of 25 countries in the international competition. There was also a lesser known hero in the 1928 fire. Two men, Fred Jackson and George Zolob, were survivors of the fire. Over the course of February 10th to 11th, they, along with their crew, tried to make their way out of the mine. Jackson had used an air hose to divert the smoke from his companions, and he cut up a smock for them to breathe through. Uh, still one man had died along the way. George Zolob decided to risk going up to the main shaft, likely to crawl out, likely crawling the whole way there. He was said to declare, maybe die, maybe no, along the way. He succeeded in getting out and getting help by telling the rescuers of the group's location. George Zolob was Polish and spoke very little English. The testimonials of his heroism in, uh, in the Porcupine Advance come from Fred Jackson. The last reference to George Zolog in the newspaper appears in an excerpt taken from Grab Samples, which was originally published in the Northern Miner in October of 1930. Fred Jackson was awarded a special medal of bravery for his actions in the Hollinger Fire, and he retotaled George Zolob's effort, including quoting him, maybe die, maybe no, along the way. George Zolob died on June 30, 1932, from heart complications and chronic bronchitis that had lasted for four years, possibly from breathing in the smoke from the fire. There was nothing published in the newspaper about his death. The only way we were able to verify was cross-referencing a death record uh, using Ancestry to show that he was there, and somebody has placed a little flower at, the, uh, at its gravesite. Moving ahead to January 1936, this was a month of many losses within the community. On January 20th, King George V died. On January 22nd, Noah Timmins dies in Florida. The headline that you're seeing in this picture was published the following day, January 23rd. Um, and, on, and this is a, an additional picture from January 27th, 1936. Six showing the entire community of Timmins to pay tribute to King George as well as um, the memory of Noah Timmins. And remember that Noah Timmins and Charles Terriot were good friends. Father Terriot had actually left Timmins to go um, to visit a family of Noah Timmins and at the time of the funeral and on January 30th a fire destroyed St. Anthony's Church. And these two pictures were taken, um, one on January 30th and February 3rd of 1936. Nevertheless, the church was actually managed to be rebuilt within a year, and it's now the current St. Anthony's Cathedral that you see. A, it's entirely made of granite, a very sturdy looking uh, building, 
and um, it's still at the same location of, of uh, Fifth Avenue and sort of Spruce City North. Nine years later, in f February 2nd, 1945, was the Paymaster Cage accident. Again, this happened on a Friday in February. On Friday, February 2nd, 1945, around 7.55 in the morning, a crew of 16 men were going down to their shift at the Paymaster Mine on a double-deck crew cage at the speed of about 1,200 feet per minute, or about 13.6 miles an hour vertical. And the Paymaster Mine is located um, sort of between Timmins and South Porcupine. Around the 900 to 1,000 foot level, a hoist man noted that the cable went slack, indicating that there was a break. The crew cage was equipped with a set of safety clamps known as dogs, designed to stop the fall in the event of a cable failure. The dogs were ripped out on the way down and the cage plummeted to the bottom of the shaft around 2,575 feet underground. 14 men died on impact and the other two died during the attempted rescue. The one, um, sort of, the one sort of consolation was that the 16 men would have likely been unconscious long before the impact. Among the 16 deceased men were Aino Nimi, who was age 19, and Russell, nicknamed Mickey Dillon, age 24. Aino was in his first week of his job. His father had been killed before his birth in a mine accident. And here there are two sort of conflicting reports. One um, account says that his father passed away shortly before his birth in a cage accident at the Paymaster. Another account says that he died in an explosion at the West Dome mine a couple months earlier. At any rate, he had, been, he had lost his father in the same occupation before he was born. Mickey Dillon was an avid hockey player and he had joined the Royal Canadian Air Force in World War II. He served as an aircraft gunner and received medical discharge from a punctured eardrum caused by flying. He returned to Canada in the previous fall and he had started working for the Paymaster Mine only three weeks earlier. An inquest into the accident took place on February 25th and 26th of 1945 and the verdict in Mickey Dillon's death would apply to all the deceased minors. And this is a close-up picture of Russell Dillon and his casket is the third ca is the middle casket in the picture that you see where it says hundreds pay last respects to accident victims. And he funeral was held at St. Yopam's Church in South Porcupine. The verdict report was, we found that Russell Dillon came to his death at 8 a.m. on February 2nd, 1945, in number five shaft of the Paymaster Mine in the township of Tisdale, through first by the breaking of the rope and secondly through the failure of the safety dogs to function properly and stop the cage. From the evidence submitted, the rope broke because of internal corrosion, of which there was no indication from external end examination. We consider the dogs faulty in design and operation and recommend that all safety dogs and attachments be approved by a competent authority appointed by the Department of Mines before permitting the use of the same. And the picture that was published in the Daily Press the next day, February 27th, shows sort of a, an enhanced um, drawing around the broken uh, cage dogs that failed to stop the cage. Also that a study be made on the prevention of arterial, interior deterioration of hoisting ropes by a commission appointed by the provincial government and every effort be made to prevent it. We strongly recommend that there be no delay by said commission in making the investigation of all cables, safety devices and hosting equipment, hoisting equipment to prevent a recurrence of the serious and deplorable accident. We will find that no blame can be attached to anyone through carelessness or neglect, said the jury document. And this excerpt comes from looking back on the tragedy that led to the creation of Sudbury's rope testing lab by Len Gillis. And Len Gillis was a former reporter here in Timmins for the Daily Press for a number of years. And he published this in the Sudbury Mine Solution Journal on February 9th of 2020, as commemorating 75 years since the accident. And this picture that you see here, it's uh, not too good reproduction, but it shows the piece of the slack cable that is a reminder of the tragedy. And the one sort of good thing that came out of it was changing the standards for examining the cables, both internally and externally, to make sure that they would be secure for the uh, crew cages.
The mine crew are buried in the uh, various area cemeteries. Aino Nimi is buried in the Tisdale Cemetery, and Russell Mickey Dillon is buried at the Legion section of the Timmins Memorial Cemetery near the historic Catholic section. Uh, the photograph that you're seeing here was actually taken by uh, Matthew Pullin, a uh, Timmins resident who has posted um, very many pictures of the different graves on findagrave.com, which is an excellent resource for looking for the different graves in the Timmins Memorial Cemetery. And you'll see that it's dated May 29th, 2021. And I did have quite a hard time. I don't, I had not yet come across this. This is a temporary marker. Um, and I'm not sure if this means that they're going to, they're, they're working on restoring a headstone or that there was no headstone for Russell Dillon, but it's located in the Legion section of the Timmins Memorial Cemetery. So as of May of this year, this was the marker for Mickey Dillon. Six years later, one of Timmins' prominent citizens and early uh, developers, um, Leo Massioli, passed away at the age of 25. And this is a f just a few pictures sort of highlighting his life. Um, on the left, you'll see the portrait of Leo Massioli that came from the Daily Press of March 27, 1939, and is a part of a two-section, 14-page feature celebrating Leo Massioli and his accomplishments, including, of course, Massioli Construction, which was uh, formally incorporated in 1938. Um, what's not ever mentioned in his, even in his obituary, was that on June 10, 1940, he and his brother Antonio were arrested and placed in an internment camp. They were released in early 1941, and I checked Porcupine in advance. There is no reference to their arrest in the uh, June, around June of 1940, but there is an article about the two brothers being released in 1941. In the center, there are some scenes from uh, Leo Massey's funeral. Uh, which occurred on April 28, 1951, and was published on April 30th. And on the right is the Leo Massioli Family Mausoleum, which is located in the historic Catholic Section D at the intersection of Rose and Peace Lanes. Just a few months later, in August of 1951, would be the, the, uh, the journey of a very fateful flight. On April 21st, 1951, Timmins-born hockey player William, nicknamed Bashing Bill Barilko, scored an overtime goal for the Toronto Maple Leafs, winning them the Stanley Cup for that year. In late August, Bill Barilko and his friend, dentist and pilot Dr. Henry Hudson, headed out to a fly-in fishing trip north of Cochrane. The airplane went missing and search crews from the Royal Canadian Air Force spent several days looking for possible wreckage, but none was ever found. The sudden disappearance without any evidence of a crash fueled much speculation and some far-fetched rumors, including one that Bill Barilko, being of Russian heritage, had gone to the Soviet Union to play hockey there. And this, came, this uh, part about the rumor came from Mirza Stone by Charlie Angus. It took 11 years before Bill Barilko returned home. On April 22, 1962, the Toronto Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup for the first time after 11 years. In June of that year, a helicopter pilot, Gary Field, spotted some wreckage under the trees about 45 miles north of Cochrane. On further investigation, the wreckage was confirmed to be Dr. Henry Hudson's airplane. Bill Barilko's body was laid to rest at the Timmins Memorial Cemetery on June 16, 1962. Unfortunately, the library's microfilm does not have a surviving local article reference to burial or whatever became of Dr. Henry Hudson because there was a considerable piece cut from the original paper of June 16th. It could have contained an article or there was nothing written. Bill Barilko's headstone rests next to those of that of his parents, Faye and Steve. It's unknown what happened though with Dr. Hudson's body. There is no record of burial with the Timmins uh, Cemetery Department, nor was a headstone found. Um, a sort of um, and a little bit of an epilogue is in October of 2011, a group of 16, including a cousin of uh, Bill Barilko named Sandra Catarello, two good friends uh, of Dr. Hudson, the late Archie Chenier and the late Dr. Shaw, went to visit the site and recover the wreckage. The wreckage of the aircraft arrived on the back of a flat bag truck in Porcupine Lake lake at the night late in, you know, of October of, 19, of 2011. The friends closed the journey by splashing some cups of water from the lake on the plane. And they had some Tim Hortons coffee cups in their vehicle that they were using to sort of christen the plane. And then they realized as they were splashing the water on that Tim Horton had replaced Bill Barickle on the, on the Toronto Maple Leafs. 
and their more detailed version, uh, story about the, um, the voyage and bringing the airplane home can be found in the National Post from October 22, 2011. In the previous presentation on the fire in Deadman's Point, um, we're talking about the Porcupine Fire of 1911, we're referring to Mrs. Marie Legris or Mrs. James Legris, as she was known then, who was a heroine of the 1911 fire. During that fire, uh, Mrs. James Legris was a switchboard operator for the South Porcupine Telephone Exchange. She stayed at her post until the building that she was working on caught on fire. And the reason that she was staying at her post so long is that she wanted to warn a construction crew on the rail line that there was a rail car full of dynamite right in the path of fire. And that railroad car full of dynamite actually did catch fire and explode. Uh, Mrs. Legra survived the fire and she served a similar heroic role in the Halebury Fire of October 4th, 1922. Additionally, she also served on the Children's Aid Society. On January 22, 1955, Mrs. Legris died after lengthy illness about 10 years after her husband, James. James and Marie Legris, both pioneer citizens, were buried in the Timmins Memorial Cemetery. There is a record of Marie's burial in the cemetery records, and it shows her fi final resting place is in row 5, section P, of the historic Catholic site. However, there is no headstone or marker for either her or James to be found everywhere. There are several gaps between the headstones throughout Section P where they may be, though. The following year, Father Charles Terrio died. Father Charles Eugene Terrio died at the hospital in Montreal after an illness on May 1, 1956. He had just turned 70 years old. When his body was returned to Timmins, he lay in state in St. Anthony's Church. An estimated 20,000 people visited to pay their respects. Two funeral services were held, one for children and one for the general public on May 7, 1956. And the picture shows his casket being taken from St. Anthony's Church. Father Terriel's body rests in the priest area of Section P, Historic Catholic and there is a large flat memorial headstone that's inscribed in English and French. Maggie Buffalo Leclerc. As we mentioned earlier, Maggie Buffalo was born to an Ojibwe family at the time they were called Chippewa, around Nighthawk Lake sometime possibly between 1860 and 1875. She's said to be a descendant of one of the survivors of the Frederick House Massacre, which occurred on New Year's um, Eve from 1812 going into 1813. And Frederick House Massacre was an event that happened at um, the Hudson's Bay posting in the early 19th century. There was a, there were two posts for fur traders at Frederick House Lake, one for Hudson's Bay Company and one for the Northwest Company on Devil's Island. It's unknown if there were actually assailants from the Northwest Company or somebody else uh, but a number of uh, people were killed at the Frederick House post and one of the survivors would have been an ancestor of Maggie Buffalo. Um, it's also known that her, she had a husband and two children that died from illness and around 1914 she married trapper William Bill LeClaire and resided around Camas Scotia Lake and she was well known in the community in the mid-century. And this picture you see here from the September 16, 1954 issue of the Daily Press shows a local artist, uh, Mrs. Wilder Clark, painting the portrait that you've seen earlier in the slideshow of um, Maggie LeClaire. And she's sitting at her home in Camas, Scotia. And actually, this would have been about a year before her husband, um, William, passed away. In 1955, Bill LeClaire died, and shortly thereafter, the community thought it would be best to have Maggie reside in the care of the Golden Manor. Uh, she left the Golden Manor and walked back to her home in Lake Kama, Scotia, but eventually she was able to be convinced to move to the Golden Manor, and she spent the last few years of her life there. Maggie LeClaire passed away on August 15th of 1965. Despite being well known in the community, however, and even made a lifetime member of the Chamber of Commerce, Maggie Buffalo LeClaire's grave did not have a headstone on it until a fundraising campaign was done in 2017, and a more representative title, Mother of Cama Scotia, was given to her in place of the Princess moniker that she was known by locally. Uh, 
Uh, this is a bibliography of the um, different sources that were used for this presentation. I'd note that the labels, for the URL labels are the websites associated with the Porcupine Advance that is digitized on uh, news.rontario.ca. They do not actually match the physical page number cited, so there's not an error in the bibliography. Those are actually the um, URLs for the individual pages. I'd like to thank you for watching the presentation here today. There will be a presentation live on September 14th, uh, 2021 uh, via Zoom for the Tisdale Cemetery. It will occur at 6 o'clock p.m. And there will be uh, an uploaded video again like this one on YouTube in the days that are following. If you would like to uh, attend the live session, you can email libraryprograms at timmins.ca. Um, if you also have any questions or that, you can contact the Timmins Public Library and ask for the reference department and they can help you with any sort of research for your family history and other information.